wanted to talk about signs. You know, signs are interesting because most of us see signs all the time and we know what it is because we've seen them forever. I mean, think about this. Like if you're uh, on the road, how many people would know what every one of these signs would mean? A better question would be, who doesn't know one of these signs? It seems like anybody that drives, right, would understand what these signs mean. But what if somebody came from a foreign country and they were visiting uh, and they looked at these signs, do you think they would understand every one of them? It's funny, I was listening to a joke a while back. Old couple gets pulled over by a police officer. He's going really fast. Oh, he's going slow, actually. Gets pulled over and they go up to the lady and they said, you know, you are only going 25 miles per hour in a 55 mile an hour speed zone. And she said, officer, there must be a mistake because I saw the sign and it said 25. Of course, that was Highway 25. <laughs> and then the officer looked in the back seat and noticed that the two grandkids of the old couple, they were white. And they said, what, what's going on with those kids? And the old foreign guy looks at the officer and says, oh, we just got off the 95. <laughs> so signs are interesting. Highway 95, Highway 101, they were going 101 miles an hour, 95 miles an hour. It's okay, Gene, I'm here for you. Um, couple other signs. So how many people know these signs? Okay, so if you're someone that's visiting from another country, uh, would you know what that M is for? You think that would be a universal sign that everybody from all over the world would know? Okay. What about a foreigner that comes in and they see the sign Subway? Would they know that that's Subway sandwiches? What about KFC? You think everybody from another country would know KFC? I think you guys are drunk. <laughs> IHOP. What would they think IHOP might be? Jumping up and down, right? What would they think Subway might be? A subway station, right? And then there, there are other signs that are here. Uh, does everybody know what each one of those signs represent? Okay. How many people would think that lady in the middle that looks like a mermaid would represent a coffee shop? Dominoes. I was watching a show one time where uh, it's called King of Queens. Have you guys ever watched that? Uh, Arthur Spooner, the father-in-law, was trying to tell his son-in-law, Doug, that <laughs> there's a new Italian pizza place in town. It's high-end. high, high end. It's called Domino's. <laughs> and then he looked at her and was like, it's Domino's, silly. How many people would know that Domino's symbol is a pizza place? How many would know that the bell is what? Taco Bell. So we, we have these signs that we have seen many times over and over again, and we, we know what those mean. So what I want to do is I want to transition and talk about there are certain signs that we will encounter as Christians. And uh, these signs are actually something that we should be familiar with. But a lot of times, we're not. 
we're like those foreigners that are trying to figure out what the bell and the domino sign mean. So I want to look at that today. So we're going to be going to 1 John chapter 1. And as we look at that, uh, I want to just begin with the first sign. The signs of the world. It says right here in this passage in verse 16, chapter 2, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Does anybody here love the world? Does anybody here love the things of the world? Like when I look at this telephone, I think to myself, man, this is a nice phone. It's not just a phone that you just talk to people. Like that's also old school, right? You actually use phones to talk to people. But with this phone, you don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to have a relationship with anybody. Even if you break up with somebody, you don't have to actually be in front of them to break up. You can just text them and say, hey, I want to break up. You know, the reason why I bought this phone, I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to get a, a Samsung. Um, I love the Note series. I had the Note 7, but then they recalled that because they say they were blowing up. And so I kept my phone hidden so nobody would take it. But then when the new phone came out, I had to decide, do I want to get the new Note or do I want to get the iPhone 10? And the reason why I chose the iPhone 10 is because it has this thing called Face ID. And so every time you, you pick up the phone and you look at it, it opens up all your, your apps. It opens up to the home page automatically. I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, I was thinking of Star Trek. Remember when they had the communicator and they were talking to people? But the iPhone, it recognizes my face, and it even says if you have a beard or if you put glasses on, it'll still recognize the contours of your face. It's, it's the technology of the world that really appealed to me. I tried two different other phones. I had a test trial, but the Face ID was great, and it was working so well until COVID came because then when I had a mask on, it said, sorry, I can't unlock it. I don't recognize you. <laughs> So now I kind of wonder if, what it'd be like to have a Samsung again. But when I look at my phone, they, they do a new one every year. They, they upgrade these phones every year. And every year they have a new feature on it, right? They have a bigger chip, it's faster, it's got more hertz on it. And I watch all these YouTube television specials and you know, videos about should you buy the new updated version or should you stick with your own? You know, technology is amazing. And it's, it's also a part of the world system. It's, it's okay to like iPhones. It's okay to want to have a nice iPhone, right? But the problem is sometimes when the world is saying, you know, you should have the latest phone. It has more features in it. If you're going to buy another phone, you know, you should buy this phone. And so he's saying right here, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world, right? But my iPhone's a thing. So, but, but then he goes on to say, if the love of the world, uh, the love of the, if they love the world, anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what does that mean, right? When it comes to the iPhone, the question is, how much do I love this? And what am I willing to do to get another phone? 
How much am I willing to spend to get another phone? And if I continue to invest in my phone, right, and then I, I start to look at, okay, here's the contributions that I've given the church and the eternal kingdom, and here's how much I've spent on my phone. And if you love the things of the world, it's really going to affect the other end as far as what you contribute and what you give and what you invest in. And so I think the most important thing is when you're asking the question, uh, okay, he says, do I love the world? It's like, what does that mean? It's the first question. What does it mean to love the world? Because when you look at that term world, uh, there's this idea of the cosmos, this idea of the world that God created that we live in, right? And this is all a part of creation. And so is John telling us not to love the world that we live in? The problem with that is when God created the world, you know, he, he surveyed all that he had created, and what did he say? It is very good. Like there was... God took pleasure in that, right? So the world is not meant that in the sense that we're not supposed to love the world, right? Because God created the world. There's a passage in Psalm 19 that talks about, uh, you know, the, the clouds declare your glory and the, the sky, you know, uh, just proclaims him. And everything about nature, we, we see a characteristic or a feature of God. Hello. So, it's not the world, but you know how, what about people? Is, are, is he talking about people here? Because in John three sixteen it says that God so what? So loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Well, why would we be told to hate the world if it says God not just love the world, but it says he so loved the world. And so as you read this, you start to understand that he can't be talking about people. In fact, think about it, that when God was creating the world, when he created humankind, it says that he made man, male and female, what? In his image. And so every single person that you look at, whether or not they're a believer or unbeliever, they were made in God's image. In fact, God thought so much about humans that he sent his son into the world, as the passage says, but he sent his son and he, he, he manifests himself in Jesus as a human. A human that dies for the sins, not only our sins, it says in John, 1 John 2, 2, but the sins of the world. And so you, you get this idea that God loves the world and, and he wants us to love the world, even in loving our enemies. So what does he mean here? Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, he goes on to explain what this means. He says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And so the world then is kind of like this system, this system of ideologies, beliefs, philosophies, uh, this system that you, you get people together and they create this world that is really opposed to the will of God. And so when you think of just the three phrases there, he talks about the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life.
Garden of Eden. You know, I'm really hungry. I'm really hungry. I haven't had anything to eat in a long time. I'm starving. I have to feed my body because right now I'm going to pass out. It's like I, my body needs, I, I need it right now. It's a desire of the flesh. You know, this whole garden is filled with all kinds of fruits, but uh, that fruit right there, it looks good. It looks desirable. I know that I'm not supposed to partake of this, but I wonder what it would taste like. You know, I just have to have it. The pride of life. Did God say you really cannot partake of the fruit of the tree? Yes, he did. But it looks so good. You will not surely die. You will become just like God, knowing good from evil. Wow. I'm hungry. Desire the flesh. Desire the eyes, it looks good. The pride of life is, if I eat this, I can be just like God. I don't have to serve God, but him and I could be in partnership. I, I could be like God. It's really good. Oh, my body, I feel it already. So that, that, that's what's being communicated, right? Because when... The man and the woman were in the garden. There was one command, right? It was the most, it was the society that had the least amount of laws in the history of mankind. There was only one law, one law that basically said, I am the creator, you are the creature. One thing you can't do, you could do anything in the world, but you, there's one thing you can't do. You couldn't blame your sister or your brother, your upbringing. You know, I had a terrible past and I was in an abusive relationship. And, you know, all of these patterns, they were learned behaviors that were handed down, right? They were the first people. In fact, they were without a sin nature. There have only been two people in the history of the world that qualified to be our representatives as far as being sinless. And even though there was one law, I can't do it. I don't want to be told I can't do it. So when we look at that passage there, you have to understand that the world represents all the philosophies, ideologies, all the religions that are opposed to God, that's what's being represented here. And so he, he simply lists three things, the desires of the flesh. The best way to understand that is what brings your physical body pleasure? What do you have to have, right? And so we think about, uh, you know, sexual Sexual items, sexual pleasure for the body. 
or food, right? Some people, I, I need to have food, 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 food. And, and, and the focus really becomes more on an individualistic basis. It's like, what do I need to satisfy me? Not necessarily because I'm thinking about other people. The desires of the eyes represents coveting. Coveting what your neighbors has. In the, in the Bible, it talks about coveting your neighbor's wife. And so, what are the things in life that we covet from people? We might covet their wife, their husband. We might covet their homes, cover their, covet their cars. Uh, we, we can covet the, the amount of money they have. And there are all kinds of things, right? And so, when you think about these categories here, you have to think about people that love too much. And I think it's important here. This sometimes is missed sometimes. He's talking to Christians. He's, he's talking to you and I. And, and this is his way of kind of helping us to examine our heart. What are the things of the world that we love? And so the desires of the flesh uh, and then the pride of life, right? The, the pride of life is this thing that doesn't just want it doesn't just want to keep up with the Joneses, but a person that has the pride of life wants to be the best. You know, I watch uh, a lot of NBA basketball, and there's this big conversation that says, well, who is your Mount Rushmore of basketball players? And people will have different lists of names, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, and, and, and they'll debate this for hours upon hours, days upon days, year upon year. Okay, Tom Brady just won another Super Bowl. Does that mean he's the GOAT, the greatest of all time? I remember of uh, the NBA championship last year when the Lakers won, they were interviewing a player and he said, am I gonna get my damn respect now? It's the pride of life. It's you're concerned about your legacy. You're concerned about what people think about you and, and how important and influential you are. And, and when you start to think about your legacy, you, you draw further and further away from the things of God. I think people love God, but the problem is the world aims to lure you away from him. And that comes to the last point is, you know, what, what, what's wrong with loving the world? Like, well, why such, is it such a bad thing? It's because the world is passing away along with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. You know, a lot of people make bad investments. They make bad investments in what's the most important things in their life. And what happens to Christians a lot of times is uh, sometimes they'll tell you that, you know, I just don't have that love for God like I had anymore or like I once did. And part of that simply is because they've fallen more and more in love with the world. Because the world makes promises about what you can get if you pursue this job or what you can, what people will think about you if you have this, this phone or this home or this occupation. Pride of life. And I'm sure that we can all think about people sometimes that they just seem to be concerned about themselves. And John here tells the house church communities that when you love the world, it's, it's a bad investment because it's going to decay. You know, people that invest in material possessions, over time, they decay. People that invest in their physical appearance, 
over time, it starts to decay. When you get older, you can't do the things you used to do. You don't look like you used to look. And the question is, will you reach a point in your life where you say, you know what, those things weren't as important as I thought they were. I have a good friend who was homeless and he had lost millions of dollars. He was a, a banker during the time when the, the banking and at the banking, but the house market, like in 2004, or five, six, was booming. He refinanced his home, just bought a new home. And then the crash came. And through a series of events, he became homeless. My wife and I, we helped trying to give him some money. But he said, you know, I might end up on Skid Row. He turned to God. He knew God growing up. But over the course of time, he started to fall more in love with the things of the world than he did with God. He started to care more about his legacy than he did about God. And then he hit rock bottom. And now he has a lot more things than I have. He's got a beautiful wife, beautiful home. He said, yeah, you know what? It took me to become homeless to realize what is truly important. The signs of the world. The world wants to lure you away from God. And it will entice you. The only way that you can be enticed, because everybody is different. And the world is out there to say, hey, there's a different philosophy besides Jesus. Uh, you know, there's a different way to feel appreciated. You don't need to pray to God. There's Google. We made Google. You can Google anything and find it on your phone. You don't even have to go talk to people now. Everything is right at your hands. So the first thing we have to understand as Christians, and we're blinded to this, even though we've been Christians for a long time, is the lure that the world is utilizing to drift you away from God until you reach a point where you say, you know what, I don't even love God anymore. I lost my love. It's because you love the things of the world. They're more important. It shows up in your, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your money. the people that you hang out with. So the first sign, understanding the signs is the signs of the world. And then we get into the second sign. The second sign is the, the signs of the time. It says here, Children, it is the last hour. And if you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So the first question when you read this passage is, what is the last hour? Is, is Jesus going to be here like at 11 o'clock? No, the idea of the last hour is, and if you look at uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 17 through 21, I believe, uh, Peter gives a sermon and he starts talking about that the Spirit came and then he ends it with, and then the, the day of the Lord will happen. And the idea is, as soon as Christ was raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit was given and people, men, women, old, young, started to speak 
started to have the Holy Spirit and started to manifest itself in how they live their lives. And so the last hour is this time period between the resurrection of Jesus and the second coming of Christ, right? And it's a wide period, right? So when you read this passage, it's important for you to understand that you are also what? You are also in the last hour. And 2,000 years ago, so was this house church community that John was overseeing. But, but look at the passage here. It says, it is the last hour, and it says, as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, right? And so the Antichrist, most of us know, and we've heard, and we, we, we've, we've been taught that the Antichrist is going to be coming at the end of the world, and he's going to be this most powerful individual, uh, and he's going to come, like, kind of almost looking like Jesus, but he's, he's actually deceiving the nations. And it's interesting here because uh, John says, yeah, that's true. There is going to be an Antichrist that's coming, but that's not what I'm talking about now. Do you see that? He's saying, so now, in his context, many Antichrists have come. Many antichrists have come. And because there are many people now that are basically trying to tell you that there's another way besides Jesus, a different idea, a different philosophy, he's like, we are in the last hour now because it's going to continue to happen. And, and for us today, it'll continue to happen until Christ returns. There will be people that are antichrists that will basically try to convince you that Jesus wasn't the Son of God, that Jesus isn't the only way. A lot of people have tried to figure out who the Antichrist is. Some people thought it was Ronald Reagan. Some people thought it was Obama. Some people thought it's Donald Trump. Some people probably still do. Some people thought it was the Pope before then. You know, Hitler. From the time of Christ until his return, there will always be people that will be basically trying to steer you away from God, to steer you away from Jesus. And so that's what's being communicated. So we have to be on guard, right? But the scary thing is, it's, it doesn't just happen from people outside like Hitler, people that are outside of the church, but he says about his own house church community, he's calling these people Antichrist. He's calling these people Antichrist. He says... They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued to stay with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. And so what's being communicated is even within our churches, within our churches, there are people that we know or that we're a part of a church that all of a sudden starts teaching a different idea about Jesus. And John said, we tried to tell him the truth. We tried to show him the real truth about who Jesus is but they still left us anyway. And while they were gone, we continued to try to explain to them the truth. It said that they never came back with them. And it became plain that they are not of us. What is he saying there? People think sometimes just because people go to church that they're Christians. 
But it's not necessarily the case. There are people that are cultural Christians. They're just part of a cultural community. They have friendships. Uh, There are people that just do it because it feels good to them, right? But they really don't have a relationship with Jesus. And some people are fooled, right? Jesus talks about during the end days, there are going to be people that said, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And then Jesus looks at them and says, depart from me for I never what? I never knew you. And John talks a lot about knowing Jesus and how we can tell if we know who Jesus is. It's a sign of the times we're in right now. There are going to be people that have a different philosophy, different idea of who Jesus is. And that brings us to the third sign here. The sign of the liars. So who are the liars? Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is what? The Christ. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the last name of Jesus is not Christ. I used to think that. Christ is a title. It means anointed one, It also means Messiah. So what these people are saying is they deny that Jesus is the Messiah. And John says that is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. So so what's being communicated here is that if you deny that Jesus is the Messiah, you're not only denying Jesus, but you're denying the Father because they are intricately connected. If you look at John 4, 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 2, he, he goes on to talk about testing the spirits, and he says that Jesus is the Son of God, right? And he says he came in the flesh, right? So there was this idea that was going around during this time period where Jesus was a man and God somehow came in his spirit and manifested himself in the man and then he lived his life during the ministry but then when he went to the cross the the spirit went back up in the air and John wants to clearly communicate that Jesus is God indwelling in human form and so if you deny the father or you deny the son you automatically, by default, deny the other person. And that's what's being communicated here. And, and, you know, for some of us, this sounds kind of difficult because it says, really, this just seems like it's kind of semantics. Or is it really important, right? Because we have this checklist sometimes. Think about people that you know that have this checklist of Jesus, right? Like, we have some friends who we really like a lot, they're, they're Muslims, okay? And so their checklist when it comes to Jesus is born of a virgin, check, was able to do miracles, check, was the Jewish Messiah, check, was the Son of God. Okay, next question. Was God manifested in human form? Um... Next question. Died for our sins. No, I can't check that. And so you're going to find a lot of people that have a lot of ideas about who Jesus is, but when it comes to that truth, John is saying, no, they're intricately connected. You can't deny one and deny the other. It's interesting because like 1 John or John, the Gospel of John starts off, it says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. 
And then there's the passage in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, if I can find it. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Do you, do you see what I'm saying here? Is this isn't just a game of semantics or saying, you know what, I know enough about Jesus, I think God will get me right in the end. He says, no, if you deny the Father, you deny the Son. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. And so what he's saying there is you have to get him right, right? Because it says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son also has the Father. This is the doctrinal test. The doctrinal test is basically the most important question when it comes to Christians is, who is Jesus? It's not what type of music you prefer. It's not what type of preaching you prefer. It's not whether or not you believe infants can be baptized. It has nothing to do with, oh, the Catholics and the, and the Protestants. It has everything to do with who Jesus is, who the Christ is, right? Get rid of calling him Jesus Christ sometimes because we think that's his last name. Jesus is the Messiah. That's what's being communicated here. And so who in our world are liars today? In the school system, you have people that say, you know, that's true for you, but it's not true for everybody. And you know what pro the problem with that is? That's an absolute claim. So in the church today, you have people that have been taught, their children have been taught in school that, you know what, relativism, What's true for you is okay. And, and we see this manifested in many ways, right? I was actually thinking about Gnosticism. I was thinking, how is Gnosticism really showcased today in a blatant way? And, and, and I just, I think of transgenderism, right? Because inside there's this thought, this is not my body. And I want to mutilate it. I want to do what I can to change it because I feel like this is who I am. And we live in that culture today. We, we live in that culture where all of a sudden you have people that can now become part of the men's football team or the men's basketball team because they're trying to do away with gender. I was, uh, Michelle, I was talking to her. She said that there's a, a bill that's trying to be passed in the legislature to basically fine any department store that labels toys girls or boys. That's where we live in today. And it's just going to continue to go downhill. And when it comes to Jesus, he was a good teacher. He cared for the poor. He fed the homeless. But he's not the only way because there's no such thing as truth. It's relative. If it's true for you, that's good, right? And that was on perfect display during 9-11, wasn't it? Because you had Americans just crying in tears and fear. They lost loved ones. It was a tragedy. Then all of a sudden, you look across the world, and you see people that are rejoicing because they destroyed two towers and they killed thousands of people. And for a person that's on this end, it's like, this is a tragedy. This is the truth. This is a tragedy. They were innocent people, right? And then when you look over here, they're saying, this is a victory. See, truth can't be relative. But that's what our children are being taught. And it's, it's so important for parents to sit down with your kids and ask, what are you being taught in school?
It's important. You can disagree on a lot of issues when it comes to the church, and we do. Sometimes we make the things that are secondary uh, primary, and we shouldn't. Sometimes we leave, and, and just because somebody leaves the church, by the way, doesn't mean that they're the Antichrist, okay? A person can leave the church because they prefer to go somewhere else, but when they start proclaiming that Jesus is a different person, that he isn't the Son of God, that he isn't born uh, a virgin, that he isn't someone who died for our sins, that he isn't God in the flesh, and they start teaching other people that they're the Antichrist because they're trying to lure people away. Signs of liars. And then lastly, the signs of true believers. Because believe it or not, when John is writing this, he's not saying anything negative about his church fellows. He's actually, he's thankful for them because he knows that they know the difference. And so what are the signs of the believers? In verse 24, it talks about things that you have been taught, right? Also in verses 20 and 21, it talks about these two issues as well. We didn't get there, but 24, it says, let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you, right? Uh, in, in what you've heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made us eternal life, right? So God wants us to abide in the truth, and there are times when you're not going to know what to do, what decision to make, and you're going to be conflicted by a lot of issues. And it's like, what are you going to do? Are you going to follow the methods and the ideologies of the world, or are you going to say, you know what, I don't know how to navigate through this situation right now, but one thing I do know is that I believe in Jesus is my Savior. And I believe that he can help me figure this out, right? That you abide in him, it means that you cling to him. Whenever things are going bad, you cling and you simply say, I'm not letting go. He says, what you've heard from the beginning, make sure you abide in him. And you know who knew this very well is John himself. Because who started among them and then departed and betrayed Jesus for silver coins, for the things that the world offered, the enticement that led him astray? It was Judas. And so I'm sure that when John sees this happening, right, he has this, this flashback, and he's very terse in the sense he's like, these guys are liars, right? The disciple that Jesus loved, everybody thinks he's very simple and nice, and they're liars, harsh language, because it communicates to you that when it comes to Jesus, there's a time to be harsh, when somebody misleads people about who Jesus is. So what you've been taught, right, the apostles' teachings, the holy scriptures, what you've been taught about Jesus, abide in those things and you're going to abide in the Father and the Son, right? But that's not all. He says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, right? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says this also in verse 20, I think, or 21. He's talking about this Holy Spirit that abides in you. That anointing that you receive from him, that you have no need that anybody should teach you something different, right? Right? But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has, he has taught you to abide in him. And, and what's being communicated is very simple. It's like when it comes to people trying to deceive us about who Jesus is, John says, you got the scriptures, you got what's been taught by the apostles. He says, I am an eyewitness of these events. I've touched him. I've seen him. I, it's written down for you in Scripture. 
And you'll hear the world debate whether or not the validity of Scripture is good or bad. But let me tell you that God has preserved Scripture and it's had many attempts to destroy it. And then the Holy Spirit that resides in you. I think sometimes as Christians, we forget about the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we just want to be fed, right? But the Holy Spirit inside you. It's like when you're, you're like, Lord, this is what this person says about Jesus. God, teach me. Help me, Holy Spirit, to understand who Jesus really is. The, the Holy Spirit gives you discernment. Easily. It'll tell you this is not who Jesus is. This person is not teaching Jesus. This person needs correction. And if this person doesn't recant, doesn't repent, doesn't return to the original tenets of the Christian faith, that person was never one of us to begin with. You know? That's John. John says, as Christians, just like you know all those signs about restaurants and all the logos and you're familiar with the traffic signals, as Christians, you need to be prepared in advance. This will continue to happen. There will be signs of the world trying to entice you. It's because of the time that we're living in. So... Anyway, I'm done. I'm done. Let's get Jesus right. We can mistake a lot of things in life, and a lot of things we're going to have to apologize for, but if there's one thing we can get right, let's make sure it's Jesus. Let me pray. Lord, I just thank you, God, that you used John because you were so adamant, Lord, that we understand that to know Jesus is to know the Father, and to know the Father is to know the Jesus, that Jesus came in the flesh, that he was deity in bodily form, that he was with God from the beginning, and he was God, and he created everything, Lord. May we cling to that, Lord, whenever life gets rocky, May we cling to that, Lord, we don't know what decisions to make in life. And may we all smile because we know it says that while the world is passing away, those that do the will of the Father live forever, Lord. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for Jesus. We love you, praise you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to love the world less and less and less and you more and more and more, God. Help us to put the priorities of our faith in tow. In Jesus' name, amen.